A mother faces the man convicted for the death of her son, Elijah McClain. I wish more than anything that we had a better outcome that night. Elijah McClain is not Peter's failure. Peter is a cause of his own demise. Conservatives are putting a tax cut in front of Colorado voters on the ballot this November, unless a bipartisan group at the Capitol comes up with a plan that they like. Folks in Pueblo have questions and concerns about plans to turn an aging Excel plant into a nuclear power site. And your good news for the 371st week around here is powered by the unusual spate of sunshine long before spring. That's tonight on Next. A rare prosecution of a medical first responder has ended with a five-year sentence for an Aurora paramedic for his role in killing Elijah McLean. Peter Chuniak is the first of two paramedics to be sentenced for giving McLean a lethal overdose of ketamine while he was held down by police. McLean was walking home when he was confronted by officers. He'd done nothing wrong. Chichuniak was the supervisor who approved giving McLean ketamine. Today, he was sentenced to a minimum of five years, the minimum, I should say, five years for second-degree assault. He got one year for criminally negligent homicide. That'll be served at the same time. Before handing out the minimum sentence, the judge heard from Chichuniak himself and Elijah McLean's mother, Shanine. I wish that I could look into Miss McLean's eyes and tell her that Elijah would be okay. I can't, and that destroys me as a person, as a father, and as a paramedic. Ms. McLean tragically lost a son, and we also lost a patient, and I don't take that lightly. Peter chose to lose my son as a patient that night by his decision to watch my son take his last breath under the weight of a bully with a badge and his indecision to act for humanity. It is possible that Chuniak will get his sentence reduced. He can ask the judge to reconsider the sentence after he's served about four months. Shanine McLean has been there day after day, week after week, month after month for the trials of all five men charged in her son's death. Sentencing for the second paramedic, Jeremy Cooper, is scheduled for April. Shanine McLean spoke with our Alex Lewis following sentencing. And Alex, based on your series of conversations with Shanine McLean, I presume that she was disappointed, but not surprised. Yeah, that's absolutely right, Kyle. You know, it's interesting because today we saw the most prison time handed down. I mean, that can be handed down to any of the first responders who've been convicted in the brutal death of Elijah McClain. But we also saw the most emotional I think I've ever seen Shanine throughout this entire process. And that might be perplexing on the surface when you think about it. But if you look back, I mean, all the way back to 2019 and you think about how Shanine threw herself in this process of getting those uh, officers and paramedics indicted and she's always looked at the big picture. I mean, she's realized that these convictions, these sentences attached to them are a part of a larger story. The way black men and women are treated at the hands of the Aurora Police Department, uh, police departments throughout the state of Colorado and really nationwide. And five years, as you said, was the least amount of time Chikuniak could have received today and expectedly, that's exactly what he got. When Shanine spoke to me through tears after sentencing, not only did she say five years she thought was incredibly lenient, she feels the whole system has failed her through this process, failed her, her son, and anyone who looks like him. I don't see no hope. I don't see no change. A little bit of law here, a little bit of law there. Nothing stops their hatred. Nothing stops their racism. And nothing stops their evil protocols and practices. We mean nothing to them. And we need to stop paying into this system because it ain't working for us. It's only working for them. Minimum, the bare minimum, always? No, we deserve better. We deserve more because we are worth more than gold. Shanine also talk, uh, told me through tears after sentencing today that she's just kind of glad that this process is almost over. But the truth is not quite. There's one more sentencing that has to happen for Jeremy Cooper uh, that will take place next month. And of course, Shanine will be here giving her third impact statement. And Kyle, she tells me that that's probably one of the hardest parts throughout this entire process. Just imagine like filtering in all of the emotion, the pain and having to give one statement to the judge, to a courtroom, to get across just how unbearable this pain has been for her. Then, and the number of times that she's been called upon to summarize what it is like as a parent to lose a child in a violent and uncalled for way. 
I know she talked today about having to hear the body camera video over and over and over, but still today having to stand up in front of that judge and speak about it in this way coherently, eloquently is even more difficult on some level than seeing that body camera video. Uh, just another tough day, Kyle. It kind of boggles the mind that they split these two hearings, so she has to do this again for a third time. But like she's been through every step of this process here, her son's voice sharing her pain and her heart, and she will be back here on April 26th. Alex Lewis, thank you very much. Even as Colorado has trended toward Democrats in the last few years, tax cuts on our ballot have proven popular with voters. Conservative groups are putting a property tax cut on the ballot in November, unless a state commission comes up with a tax cut that's more to their liking. Politics guy Marshall Zellinger takes us inside their back and forth today. The commission that has to come up with a way to reduce property taxes or at least minimize future property tax increases just gave itself more time to figure it all out, partially because of the people trying to put issues on the ballot for voters to decide in November. If nothing is done here, there, there will be a ballot initiative. Former Republican state lawmaker Josh Penry represented Colorado Concern, a conservative business group, which supported the governor's Proposition HH in November, but is now partnering with one of the thorns in the governor's side, conservative activist Michael fields. Government shouldn't be growing faster than our wages. And what we just saw this year is a huge spike. Together, they have proposed three ballot issues that would reduce property tax rates to 2022 levels and then cap the state's property tax revenue each year at 4%. That would mean smaller property tax bills, but also fewer dollars for schools, fire, police, water, trash, everything your property tax dollars pay for. Their three proposals all call for the state to cover the dollars that would no longer be coming from your property taxes. I think it's easy to say, hey, state, you take care of it, make sure we do full backfill to the locals, but that immediately then raises the question, where does the state find two and a half billion? Uh, do you have any thoughts on that for us? The idea of a backfill is not new. You all have talked about it before HH contemplated it. Um, the difference is you did it with taxpayer, it was proposed with taxpayer refunds rather than from the base budget. If we really do need to backfill, I don't recommend taking money from the state budget. What I do recommend is finding an additional revenue source. Scott Wasserman is from the Progressive Bell Policy Center, which has its own ballot issues that would try to block the ones from Penry and Fields. One of the proposals says if their 4% property tax revenue cap is approved by voters, it cannot take money away from local governments without voters opting in in a separate election. Our measures this year are meant to counter their measures. They would not be on the ballot, but for the threat of ballot Armageddon. Awful movie, ballot Armageddon. That property <laughs> tax commission was supposed to present a report to state lawmakers two weeks from today. Ideas for potential legislation or ballot issues proposed by lawmakers. A little more than an hour ago, that commission gave itself more time until next month to see which of the citizen ballot issues qualify for the ballot and what they may need to actually compromise with. In a way, and this is very imprecise, but in a way, it's almost like there's a shadow legislature or a shadow government, which is the ballot process in front of citizens in Colorado that at least the right sees as their best way to win on issues these days. We talk about the lack of conservative power in it's the state legislature. It is at the ballot. The, the issues they can't get through the legislature, voters are interested in when it shows up on a ballot. Mm -hmm. And this commission, slightly more Democratic than, than, than anything else, uh, has to figure out what can we do to take some of their ideas but not have it be as drastic as, as the worst case scenario in their minds. And everybody watch Ballot Armageddon before it gets taken off of Netflix this weekend. <laughs> Marshall, thank you. Bennett is a town divided. I mean, like, quite literally by I-70, North Parts, Adams County, South Parts, Arapahoe County, covered by two sheriff's offices until now. The deal with Adams County went south. So if calls for help north of the interstate, they aren't emergencies, they will get routed to the town's board of trustees. Kelly Rinke's along to look at how that'll work or won't. Yeah, hey, Kyle, today the contract with Adams County ended. So for now, Adams County deputies won't respond to complaints or other calls that aren't emergencies. So let's see. to call town staff or uh, the Board of Trustees for help. Bennett says about 3,000 residents live in this part of town. The town says negotiations with Adams County didn't work out because of a lack of communication in the sheriff's office. 
8%. Uh, Bennett wants Arapahoe County Sheriff to cover all of the town now. It looks like that will happen. The county commissioners need to approve that contract. Bennett says they hope for services to start back up in April. I hope folks got that. I apologize. Um, there were there were two microphones covering you, and we only paid for the contract on one, uh -oh. uh, so we lost some of that. Uh, but we're going to continue to follow what's going on in Bennett because at the end of the day, that has real impacts. If you call needing assistance and you get routed to the guys at the board of trustees, yeah, we'll see how this works out in March. All right, Kelly Rinky, thank you. When I saw Kendrick Castillo's parents asking the community to fund a memorial for their son at the park near the school where he gave his life stopping a school shooting. I knew, all, I knew that you all would want to help, that you would not want to make them go out there and ask again and again and again. Your latest Word of Thanks microgiving campaign is going to the Kendrick Castile Memorial Fund. In the last couple of days, you have already fully funded the memorial going in at Civic Green Park near Sem School Highlands Ranch, where the shooting happened in 2019. So now all of the additional dollars that we raise will start the scholarship in Kendrick's memory. His parents intend to use it to support students going to college who share Kendrick's passion and ability for robotics. Scan that QR code on your screen or text the word thanks to 303-871-1491 to get the link to join me in donating. This will hopefully allow Kendrick's family and friends to focus on putting that memorial in the park and finding scholarship recipients rather than having to go all over town fundraising. And at the end of the month, they're going to get another big check from all of you who have signed up to make a monthly donation to the Word of Thanks Fund. And more than 1,700 of you are now monthly donors. You can use that same QR code or text to get there. People living in Pueblo at the shadow of a coal plant wonder about the future of living in the shadow of a nuclear plant. My good news is it's a beautiful day to play Frisbee. Our neighbor's joys seem to flow more freely at higher temperatures. You ever notice that? You will next. Folks in Pueblo County are getting a preview of Colorado's energy future. Some tough discussions to come because XL Energy is retiring its coal-fired Comanche station in Pueblo at the end of the decade, and it's considering whether nuclear energy could take its place. Neighbors packed into a town hall last night to put their concerns on the record. I want to have a place for my kids to continue to grow up where there is sustainable jobs. So what you're creating out here in Pueblo is a toxic waste dump. Because right now, there's no place to store this material. No place. A committee put together by local leaders in Excel is recommending this switch to nuclear, either at the Comanche site or somewhere else in Pueblo County. Supporters say closing the Comanche plant could have a nearly $200 million impact on Pueblo County's economy, and that a move to a nuclear plant is the only viable option to fill that gap. Critics have a whole lot of concerns, like where the plant's waste will be stored and what will happen to union jobs. This is still early. Committee says that a nuclear option, so to speak, likely would not be ready for years after the Comanche plant closes. So even if Excel is on board with this, it's going to have to go through a lot of steps, not the least of which is approval from state regulators. Lauren Robinson, if we had to get approval from our regulators before we said anything, oh, wait, we do. There are words we're not supposed to say on TV, but you never use those words on or off TV, and neither do I. It's all just sweetness and light for the two of us. That's exactly right. I'm, I'm glad you pointed that out. Yeah. For, thank you. All right. Well, outside, we do have a sunny day. The sun is starting to set, but still beautiful over downtown Denver. 56 degrees right now. Earlier today, we saw a high of 66 degrees. And for a bit of reference, our seasonal high this time of year is 50 degrees in Denver. So we were over 15 degrees warmer than average. The winds have started to calm down a bit as well, now coming in from the north northeast at 7 miles per hour. Our HD Doppler is still very empty over Colorado, though our next system will be making its way in as we move our way into the weekend. On its way in, it's going to bring in some very gusty winds all across the state, but it's really a story of fire and ice because we're going to see widespread strong winds all across Colorado. The eastern half will be paired with dry air, so we have red flag warnings today and tomorrow for the eastern half of the state, but the western half of the state will be paired with snow, so these strong winds will lead to winter weather alerts. We have winter storm warnings for northern portions of the high country and winter weather advisories for southern portions. These areas will expect a good amount of snow, but also with these winds gusting up to 70, 75 miles per hour, it creates that blowing snow, reduced visibility, wide out conditions. So another day, another warm day in store for tomorrow. Sunny but windy. We're going to watch for some snow to really pack in across the high country Sunday, uh, Saturday evening. Sunday, we're watching for some isolated rain and snow showers across the front range. Then we dry out Monday and Tuesday.
My good news is it's March 1st and I have open water to go enjoy a beautiful vessel, maybe enjoy some fishing. Is this fall spring? Of course it is, but who cares? Sunny and 60 means we're going outdoors to search for your good news. It's our guaranteed way to end your week with a smile because you're hearing about the joy of others. Next. May I make a recommendation? Point you towards someone else's work? It's an outside view of Denver's current migrant crisis, a chance to see our city as outsiders see our city. It's through a conversation that I had this morning with Michael Smirkanish, whose radio show is heard nationwide on Sirius XM Radio. Smirkanish does not come at things from a traditional left-right uh, approach politically, and I, I found his questions about what it's like to be in Denver these days to be pretty direct and honest and without a lot of the slant that you hear applied sometimes. And I, I hope that I gave answers that were similar. You can find a link to our conversation in this podcast in the next section of 9news.com and on our social media pages. What a day to not have to sit inside like some kind of sucker. Perhaps like I did, you did. So let's adventure vicariously through our neighbor's sunshiny good news. Bright bluebird sky days, calm weather, super nice, excited. Make something happen. My good news is it's March 1st and I have open water to go enjoy a beautiful vessel, maybe enjoy some fishing and uh, enjoy what Mother Nature has offered us. My good news um, this week is I just accepted a full offer on my house back in Wichita, Kansas. I moved here in July and we are looking forward to closing this chapter and um, moving on. I just bumped into a gentleman over here that's, that's my sad part of my story. I'm a widower right now and the anniversary's coming up and it's kind of hard, but I bumped into a gentleman that just lost somebody too. So we had a great moment together, just, just man to man, just going through our agony, but we had some, we had some peace about it, which was really amazing. Well, my good news is I just dropped an EP now. You can check it out on all streaming platforms. It's called A Figure, the EP. I'm from Lagos, Nigeria. I make Afro beats and I integrate a little bit of hip hop and R&B in it too. Check it out right now, it's the biggest music right out right now. My good news is it's a beautiful day to play Frisbee. My good news is that uh, with our partnership with Number 38 out in Rhino, they put our logo right on the side, right next to the Avalanche and the Nuggets, which is so exciting for our team and for the community. Really great news. First time delivering feedback on Next, it's sports anchor Ariel Orsudo. God bless you and your great jackets. We're back with your feedback next. The most Colorado thing we saw today is a genius way to avoid baggage fees when flying Frontier. Beth snapped a photo on a flight from Denver to Salt Lake. She thought she was smart because she wore three days worth of clothes and hiking boots rather than checking a bag. But then that dude's wearing his ski boots on the plane. He's going to save on the rental fee. Imagine walking through an entire airport in ski boots. Do -dum, do -dum, do -dum. If you see something that looks like Colorado to you, send it our way. Elisa Ortiz writes in with her thanks to you for funding the Kendrick Castillo Memorial. Thank you, thank you. We can do great things. Yes, we can. 